So I guess we are live. We are live and I will get us started um, now that our attendees have come in. So okay. I would just like to thank um, um, and say good morning to those who are joining from Africa and Europe and good afternoon to those joining from Asia. Thank you for joining today's online event, Customer Insights. Will your innovation withstand the ever more demanding needs of your customers um, as part of our Knowledge Transfer web series? If you have joined us here before, um, thank you again for coming back. If you are new, welcome, and we hope that you will join us going forward. Uh, we are gonna get started shortly, so I'll just make some brief introductions. My name is Elisa King, and I am the Marketing and Communication Manager at the World Innovations Forum. Firstly, I would like to go over some new housekeeping. Uh, as you have seen, we have changed our platform from GoToWebinar to Zoom, so things might look a little different. However, there is still a question panel that you can use. And if you have any questions throughout the webinar about the topics being discussed, please post them in there and we will address them at the end. If you have any technical difficulties throughout this webinar, uh, please feel free to chat me. It's a Lisa Team We Forum, and I will try and address them as I can. And you do not need to take any screenshots throughout this presentation either. We will record this video and then also share with you the presentation following in the next few days. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker for today. If you've been on our webinars before, you know him well. If you are new, um, then here's a quick introduction. So I would like to introduce our speaker, Axel Schulter. He is the founder and chairman of the World Innovations Forum. He is a highly successful entrepreneur who spent most of his business life in Silicon Valley and started and exited four companies, one IPO'd. He successfully raised almost 20 rounds of funding from VCs, angels, and four from crowdfunding. He also helped raise countless rounds of funding for startups. So he is well versed in what you need to know today and understanding your customers. So without further ado, Axel, I will let you take it away. All right, thank you very much, Alyssa, and also good morning, good afternoon uh, from my side. Topic today, customer insights, um, and also with a sort of subtitle, open innovation, because open innovation has become a real buzzword, and we definitely want to address it, because in this particular case, customer insights for innovation, open innovation is actually, so to speak, the mechanic um, behind that to do that. Uh, before I start, just real quick, our team is, um, you know, steadily increasing. And so we have um, on the very low right hand side, we have Kareem as a new member of our team. He is the ambassador for Singapore. And um, so we will, as you probably know, uh, do a couple of interesting things in and with Singapore, in particular when it comes to funding of uh, innovative businesses. Today, we want to talk about customer insights and inno open innovation, as I said, and this is part of the knowledge transfer series. Uh, you've seen the, you know, probably some of this before. And what I want to do, which we do all, in every of these uh, knowledge transfer series, I have two slides about the background, why we at the World Innovations Forum and also our sort of for-profit company, uh, Blue Column, um, have a very different view and could have a very different view of idea creation. Um, we all know it's from the brain um, and still most people up until recently, including myself, thought it comes somehow magically. Um, obviously the brain is a complex thing, probably the co most complex organ in the universe, um, but it's interesting to understand that also this thing is just a piece of matter and matter basically forms and organizes after certain rules and regulations. And so there is no magic and there's no accidental and then there's no um, any other divine injection. Um, our brain works after a certain pattern and there is this very surprising realization that we, Homo sapiens, are actually not able to create anything. And we cannot create new ideas. Neither we nor they get injected. And if we look into this picture, we can actually realize, okay, there's something going on in these neurons, these so-called
Well, it looks like we may be experiencing some technical difficulties from Axel's side. Um, I'll wait a few minutes to see if you can come back online for us. So sorry about that, everybody. It looks like they're having some, just some technical and internet issues in their location that they're at. If you can stay on the line for a few more minutes, uh, hopefully they'll be back shortly. I know that this comes, sometimes happens. And with an online system like this, I, uh, it was bound to happen a couple more times. So we hope that he can come back on pretty quickly. Uh, if not, then uh, we will let you know what's going on and um, hopefully we can get everything sorted out shortly. Uh, if you have any questions in the meantime, please feel free to ask. Uh, if it's about WeForum in general, I can try and answer them for sure. And if it's about the topic today, well, we will have to wait a little bit on that one um, as Axel is the one with the knowledge of that. In the case of the concreto, it's here and this thing. It bounced a little. In UK, com completely down? Yeah, there is no We have a internet. Somebody broke the internet. Um, it looks like I am back. You are back, Axel. Okay. If you would like to start your presentation, otherwise I can do your presentation from my end so that it doesn't overload you, um, please let me know. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll just um, start again. Um, and I need to go to share first. Correct. Share my screen. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so I should be back and everything should be good, right? You are back online. We can hear you. Okay. You're not frozen yeah. anymore. And uh, our attendees are just waiting for you to get started. All right. So just, you know, we, we were talking about the quick reminder where we came from. So we understood that new ideas are actually composed from previous experiences and not accidentally created. And that has a major, I mean, an unbelievable impact of how we see innovation in general. And uh, with, with that said, we need to rethink innovation because it's not just brainstorming, because our brain does a couple more things in order to get to disruptive and innovative ideas, actually groundbreaking innovation. And so um, we learned a ton of things and um, I don't want to go through this list entirely but um, experiences are the key driver is one thing. Um, only by understanding the biggest problems of our market, we can actually begin to strategically innovate. Uh, so we need to understand the problems rather than just coming up with ideas. With a team of only experts, which is typically an innovation team, we lack the diversity and therefore we cannot 
innovate very well because 10 experts is great, 100 experts is simply more of the same. And uh, so there's these many sort of um, you know, counterintuitive things when we talk about innovation because we need, for instance, the diversity. Um, and so brainstorming gets us to new ideas fast. And this is a critical thing. But those ideas are the obvious ideas only because our brain is the most energy consuming organ in our body and it comes up with ideas. This is the whole concept of our, of our living existence that we have ideas, but because of the energy consumption, it's only the obvious ideas. So the one that comes fast, quickly based on past experience and here we are, but they're never groundbreaking. They're never completely changing everything because our, brain is not wired to do that. However, we know that since 300,000 years, we are innovating, you know, from small back in the old days to ever more complex. So we know it works. We just did not know how. And this is basically the foundation of everything we do uh, in the World Innovations Forum and also in, in Blue Column um, on, the, on the topic of innovation. So we're on the brink of a whole new understanding of our brain in terms of innovation. So if you're ready for that, we want to start with something that is very tied to the concept of open innovation. And for most inter and, uh, big enterprises, a no-go. Starting innovation together with customers to get the customer insight of their problem. Now, if you think about what I just said, it's funny, isn't it? It's all about experiences. Experiences is what our customers have with what they do every day. We want to innovate a or develop a groundbreaking innovation that they have it fundamentally better. With our experience, it's difficult. With their experience, it's so much easier and actually even possible. So the interesting thing is when you look at how startups create innovation, it's typically a small team of three, four, five, six, seven people. Typically this entire team works on the idea creation or composition as we would probably better said because it's from our past experiences. But if five people with five very different past experiences start combining ideas, we get much further but still not far enough because we don't know what the customers actually want and do and where their biggest issues are. Even though we may have discovered it already and this is why we thought we, we support uh, sort of the, 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 the customers and we have an idea of the solution. But when you look in any and have a chance to speak to any of these groundbreaking idea creating in uh, um, startups, you will notice that they had the problem very similarly to the customers they are serving, but only with getting the customer insights, they can actually form a solution that becomes groundbreaking. And so if I look back in, in my own businesses, so the first was Computer 2000. Um, we heard, you know, very successful. I was lucky. We grew to a, a billion in revenue, did the IPO, five billion in revenue. We formed a merger under equals with Tech Data, which was a very similar company than, than ours. We were both the same size. And this company today is 37 billion in revenue. So the question is how could one or two people come up with an idea for a $30 billion company? Well, it worked because our founders team me and my, my partners, and then a couple early on team members had very different backgrounds because one was the finance guy, one was the, was the, the a sales guy, and then yet another was an operations guy. I was the market sort of uh, market and marketing uh, person. And together we came up with these super different facets of what is the ideal idea. And fast forward, next company, Infinigate, we did the same thing. And then another fast forward with Blue Roads, 
um, in, in California, we did the same thing. Now there I met a lot of other entrepreneurs and as you know, Silicon Valley is a, is a very open space. We can talk to each other very easily. And we realized that we're all on the same page in terms of how do we actually come up with these crazy ideas. And in no case, it was a spark and then the founders sit down and then build the product and then try to sell it. None of these situations were in a, in a way that it was exclusively their idea. So customer insights are critical for innovation. And that's something undebatable. I mean, obviously we can debate it <laughs> all day long, but when you look at the history of Elon Musk, of uh, Stephen Jobs, of, you know, I mean, you name it, all the same scenario. Interestingly enough, in Blue Roads, we hired our first product manager was actually a direct report from Stephen Jobs. And people say, yeah, but Stephen Jobs, he had all these magic ideas and he was so, he did not tell anybody. It was always a big secret. And then he came up with the magic. Totally wrong. Never did that way. He understood by listening extremely carefully to customers, what they want, how they do things, what their idea would be and their dreams. And this is what Stephen did better than anybody else. Their dreams came to him, so to speak, through interviews, through all kinds of sources. And then he crafted the idea based off customer insights. And that made it happen. It's not that, you know, there is a magic spark from somewhere. So um, with every these different people around them, around me, around all the others, we were able to actually build these kind of amazing, amazing companies. And the rest of the world, pretty much every enterprise avoids speaking in too great details to the customer because their fear of somebody stealing the idea, particularly the competition is so high, is higher than actually the opportunity they see. And this is why continuously startups can knock down pretty much any, any big enterprise. I mean, 10 years ago, it was almost impossible to even think that a company like Tesla has the 10 times as big of a company valuation, capital value on the stock exchange than Mercedes Benz, you know, the, the founder of the automobile industry, so to speak. But Elon and his team is disrupting the automobile industry in a way that investors say that is the future. I mean, if you have seen Battery Day and you will wonder, I mean, Tesla is a car manufacturer and they do, I mean, a hell of a lot of stuff about batteries. Yeah, it's important, of course, but you know, will a better, better battery be faster and make it the car faster or better or something? Yes, but most people don't understand. Most people have not understood the criticality of the battery. And at the end of the day, Tesla's battery company and an electric car manufacturer, very much like Google. Everybody sees Google as a search engine. Is not. Google is the biggest advertising company in the world. 90, I think 6% of their revenue comes from advertising. But nobody perceives this company as an advertising company. We perceive them as a search company. And yeah, by the way, there's a lot of advertising in there. And sometimes it gets too annoying because the first two pages when we search is full of advertising. Um, and so they're on the brink of actually getting sort of over, over overexcited about their business model. But it's interesting also there, they understood in the early days, despite there were about 30 different search engines, they understood that the, that the algorithm of search is the key to actually serve up the right content. And with that algorithm, they also understood so much about the search mechanism of a human being that they could actually serve up relevant advertising to these people, which made their advertising business 
simply more attractive than all the others. So again, also here, and if we go, we could go from company to company to company to company. Customer insights is the key for innovation. If we don't know what they want, we cannot innovate for them. That is very clear. And since there is no, and this is the other key part, since we understand there is no accidental idea that just sparks and we hope we get one and then we run and we believe we can change the world. This is just not a reality. It doesn't work that way, even though many people tell us because most of the people don't know. I mean, you can have a hard time probably to talk to any of these innovators. And so I've been asked probably a thousand times, I mean, literally a thousand times, you know, how do I came up with these ideas and I didn't know. I only knew that I had seen problems and I was working on them, talking to a lot of others and talking to the customers. How, what would be their perfect scenario? I didn't want to suggest anything to them. And I think Marita said once, the biggest thing I have is the ability to listen. And maybe that is a criticality in innovation. And I have it and probably most others have it too. But this is something you can train very easily. This is a skill. This is nothing magic. This is not born. You're not born as a listener or non-listener. This is just sometimes in your life you realize, okay, really listening, listening carefully uh, is, is a good thing to do. So, um, and, you know, I just started to talk about the biggest fear. My idea may get stolen. So if we, and I go back again, if we understand that our idea is actually already a composition of experiences and every experience like you listening to me now, seeing the screen, you know, by the way, okay, look, looking out the window in, in, in between and so forth, all these experiences are, yes, your experiences, but all these inputs coming from the outside and everything you learned come, came from others. And all you do from learning, creating ideas based on experiences. So learning and experiences is a direct connection. There, there is nothing in between. Learning, experiences, basically the same thing. So idea creation from past experiences, which was learning, is what we do. And it comes from others. So our ideas don't come from our chemical that they say, ooh, how about this? No, the chemicals can't do that. They can only mix and match uh, experiences. So that would mean that stealing your idea is a stupid concept. It cannot be stolen because you didn't even create it in the first place. You composed it. Now, if you have a simple idea based on brainstorming, which we said earlier, is sort of one of the most obvious ideas. Obviously, somebody else can say, ah, yeah. And by the way, we will be much faster than this stupid guy. And yes, this is considered stealing an idea. But it will happen. I mean, whether you tell people or not, it will happen if you're not fast and cool enough and not executing on your idea. And important, if it's a simple idea, then it's not valuable enough to invest a lot and to bring it out. And therefore, you need to look for innovative ideas. And they come not from you, but from you in connection with your customers. And so forget about ideas get stolen for a couple of reasons. Number one, it isn't your idea in the first place. So that's you know, if, if you digest that, then you still can say, yeah, but it, it, it happened in my mind. And so nobody else had it. So it's mine. Okay. Let's say it is yours. Um, you will notice that many ideas pop up almost at the same time on earth. Because we as a society, as a global society, we have problems all on all corners of the earth. And it's very likely that other people may say, eh, you know what, I have an idea. We could do this or that. And then says, you think they've stolen your idea, but they didn't because they have been actually 
on the same track than you were. And an obvious idea is very simple to create. But when you mix your obvious idea with all the customer insights that you can get, this idea may become more and more complex. So when we had uh, uh, in my previous company, for instance, this was a channel management software, we had a very cool idea about how we distribute leads. But we also had to come up with, with reporting that leads, how, to, how to work with a lead gives a value to the customer. We created a lead cube, I mean a three-dimensional model, how leads get from hot leads to cold leads, but there was an X or a Z axis because over time things change. And we put this as an algorithm into the application so that we can calculate it. Most of these things were not the core idea. The core idea was leads can be pulled instead of get pushed out. But all the other things around it lead to closure rates in the reporting system and so forth, they made it more and more complex. But at the same time, those who had the problem, but only those who had that problem, really appreciated it. Our competitors never understood why we bypassing them right and left, and we became within five years as a latecomer into this market, we got out as the market leader, and we were actually our biggest competitor who had $70 million from pre-IPO, oh, sorry, pre-bubble uh, IPO in the, in the cash, in the, in the bank. And we had basically started with $500,000. Um, people said, you know, you never out money them. There's no way. But we were at a point where we actually acquired them and the acquisition did not take place because we realized we stole all their customers. So, but we didn't steal their idea. We were just better. But the reason why they could not outperform us was not because our idea was better. They could have copied it right and left, but because the whole thing that we developed was an innovative solution that our customers wanted and they did not understand what it actually was. Take Uber. I mean, every taxi organization in the world could have built an app very much like Uber 10 years ago. 10 years after Uber is now a world leader next to Grab in, 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 in Asia, taxi, under, uh, taxi organizations still do not understand what Uber actually develops. They think it's a cheap app and people who are needing money can drive and they're basically paid worse than the taxi drivers which in some case may be true, in other cases, it's the other way around. But nobody understood the whole performance of Uber, the whole business model of Uber and the simplicity of Uber because people were not able to sneak into this head of what Uber does. Take Airbnb. I mean, Airbnb is now, I think, 12 years in the market. They took 35% of the hotel business away. The biggest hotels in the world take it, you know, uh, whatever it is, Hilton or uh, take, take um, you know, Holiday Inn. I mean, all these organizations which have, I mean, millions and millions and millions uh, made and in the bank did not understand what, what Airbnb does. And so the bigger the idea is, the harder it is to copy. Mercedes-Benz and BMW and Porsche and Ford and General Motors and you name it, Toyota and so forth, did not understand what actually Tesla is doing. They think it's the electric car, but it isn't. Most people think it's the electric car, but it isn't. It's the batteries. Tesla is a battery business and their whole concept is batteries, electric cars, digital experience, making out of what they can do, the fastest electric car in the world, sometimes faster than even the fastest, <laughs> you know, uh, um, uh, uh, engine cars. And that was and is their advantage. Can the idea stolen? Theoretically, everybody can build an electric car, but it's not understood how this actually works in context of all the things they do. 
And so again, innovation is more than just one spark. Innovation is a whole conglomerate of idea snippets, as we call it. And so to steal that is almost, I'd say almost impossible. I mean, we have seen companies basically taking over those disruptors and disrupting the disruptors. Grab in Singapore is one. Grab is in Asia, not only bigger than Uber, they actually acquired the Uber business in Asia and Grab probably takes over Uber uh, in the next couple of years. So Uber gone, Grab it is. But this is one case out of you know, many, 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 many uh, disruptive companies. So stealing an idea is very, very difficult and only possible if the company that had the idea in the first place is simply not performing. And so you heard it all, probably, I'm pretty sure it's all about execution. But still the idea, the spark of the idea, the key to everything, but it's only the key, it's not the building. And if the building is locked, you need the key. Of course, and innovation, so to speak, is the building and you need the keys, the spark of the idea. But you still need to build the building. And when you have it, then the building is what is, is valuable, not the key, even though you can't get into the building without the key. So there is a very funny uh, a chicken and egg problem and the chicken is the big and the egg is the small, but you cannot, cannot, I mean, I would say in 90% of the cases, sit down and fear about somebody stealing your idea because the complexity of the market that tells you what to do and you are taking all these inputs together and building a homogeneous solution with all the various aspects that is the key to innovation. So open innovation is basically making your customers part of the innovation process. And here on the right hand side, you see everybody, yeah, you make every, every of your customers who is part of this basically a hero and everybody feels I contributed, but everybody also understood it's the sum of all. It's not like, oh, they took my idea and I didn't get anything. Well, first of all, there is something that they get, basically the fulfillment of their ideas, <clears throat> but it's many people. And if you look at companies, all of them who had basically these ideas could have done the same thing, but all of them also realized, well, it takes millions to build it, countless funding. It, it takes a management team, it takes employees, it takes production and so forth. So the idea vanishes away in terms of value and the execution grows in terms of value. And so when you look for an open innovation concept is when you involve your existing customer base, if you're a startup, you don't have a customer base, then you involve these potential customers, still the same people, yeah? So when your innovation concept of your company is structured that you will want to get all these inputs and are focused on building the most, the best possible product and by Binding all these info, innovation, uh, innovative ideas and, and, and information and every feedback you get, you come to a point that you build or want to build a product that is actually impossible. And this is something different than what, what, what we were talking about today, but keep this in mind. Once you get to the point of impossibility, then, then you know this is an innovative solution. And that impossible product cannot be uh, copied because it's impossible today. If anybody would have asked the founder of Tesla, um, I forgot his name, I, I just read about him yesterday. Uh, you know, Elon Musk came actually years later. They had this idea of um, building this electric car, a sports car, and he had all the positive things were already there. But everything that has been evolving, one thing, batteries, uh, the biggest thing, they couldn't imagine that they can go a thousand miles with one battery load. 
And still today, it's actually not possible. But back then, it was actually 150 or 400 miles. Now it's somewhere between 300 and 600 miles. And we get to 1,000 miles as sure as hell. So the vision will come true. And if you are this realist and living in the here and now and everything else is just fluff, you cannot innovate. But if you have a vision and say, okay, we want to get to a thousand kilometer or miles, then you will probably because you're focusing every energy of new innovation ideas on top of the other to get there. And if that is the dream of all these people and if you know, look at them and said, yeah, they're excited because now we are at a thousand miles. Well, because every brain contributes to making it happening. And so open innovation is the key to any innovation. With no customer insight and no not having their experiences, your innovation will be very flat and will be probably non-existing. It will be an improvement, no question. It will be nice and you have fun building it, but it will never be successful. So open innovation is a key to real disruptive innovation. The term is probably many years old and people didn't really know, they just felt it's a good idea because those who have been involved with their customers in the innovation process are more successful than the others. Didn't exactly know why, but today we know. It's their customer's experience that contributes to the confluence of the ideas from many, many people that makes it an innovative idea. So when we get there, we get their ideas, we get their needs, they tell us what they want, and this is all good. But there's something that a few people, including myself, did. And honestly, I don't even know why I tried this very hard. I tried to get the, to the dreams of our customers. I always wanted to know if there would be all money on earth, all resources, you know, forget all physical laws, what would be your ideal solution? I always ask that question. The very first time when I started Computer 2000, I wanted to build the ideal company. And my partners back then said, come on, Axel, come down to earth. Uh, I know that you're a big visionary, but you know, let's, let's do what's real because everything else is a waste of time. And I agreed because I, I, I realized that they don't understand the concept, which I had. If we get to their dreams, that would give us the direction of our vision. And in our case, the dream was no, no conflict of interest in the channel. You know, uh, resellers were fighting against distributors, distributors against system integrators. I mean, it, total mess. And I said, okay, we need to break through that. And so my partner said, okay, I mean, yeah, you can give it a try, but I think we will not survive. And even they, the customers told us, it's probably impossible because you cannot get enough margin for you to be a distributor without the margin from, you know, big deals. And we started anyway, and I said, I will not make a single deal um, bypassing my channel partners, no matter how big it is. And we got six months later, basically to bankruptcy because the dream was simply physically, financially impossible. But I said, I'd rather close the company because I had no interest. I mean, I, I, was, I was a you know, top career guy at Rockwell International, which was one of the cool, fancy companies building all the electronics for space shuttle and for now science so on. I'm not in this business to just build yet another distributor. If my concept doesn't work, then I would stop. And I told this one of my, you know, closer partners and said, no, I, this, this is a promise, you know, and if I give a promise, I would probably, you know, cut my arm before, before I not fulfill my promise. Okay. And then there was a situation where BSF was ordering basically a thousand graphics cards. For us, this one deal was bigger than our entire annual revenue. And yeah, it's tempting, but 
I thought, you know, yeah, sure. We would survive a little bit longer, but then we would become like everybody else and no interest. And so I talked long story to this guy and, and I said, no, um, we, we cannot do this. But, and he said, young man, you know, I was 26 or so. Um, and he was a real big senior. And he said, young man, I mean, you don't know who I am. And I can tell you, we would in a heartbeat order in, in the US. And I said, okay, give me five minutes to explain what I'm trying to do. And I tried, I, I explained to him, I want to change distribution because this is a total fuck up. And you know, we want to do it this way. And he was silent and he said, okay. And he was silent again and said, you know, we have the same problem. I said, yeah, you can help solve this. And if it's just an example, and if we fail, then you don't have to fail. And he said, you know, you, you, you are an amazing person. I mean, I've never seen somebody <laughs> negotiating so hard. And he said, okay, I will try. You tell me which dealer, you write me a letter, you sign it, that you will support us in any phase, no matter what the dealer does. And I did. And so we got that deal. And the reseller that I picked um, was completely blown away from this deal. And he asked me, so why is it? And I said, because I gave you guys the promise that we will never do that. I would rather stop the company because this is the vision of the whole company. And so what I didn't know, he was the dealer, uh, what was it, the dealer representative at the IBM Dealer Association. And so he must have told the next couple of days because it took less than a week that orders flooded in. So what we did is we tried to understand the dream of our partners and fulfill that dream. It was actually impossible. We just were, I have to say, lucky, but luck is oftentimes basically very much associated with a very, very, very powerful idea. And so we made it and the rest is history. So I say this because I did this two more times in my then consecutive companies. And I realized when talking to others that they are actually doing something very similar. So it was very clear the dream discovery of your audience is probably the most important driver for a visionary innovation. Whether it's possible right now or not does not matter, but it gives you the dream of them. And if you can fulfill their dreams, I mean, how could you not be successful? It would be almost impossible to not succeed. And so this became sort of my, you know, my major thrust in every company I built and every, yeah, <laughs> we're successful. And I believe it's part of that. And so again, if you are not getting the insights of your customers, that would never happen. Now to get the, to the dreams is a difficult one. And this is what we learned actually only after we started understanding the, the, the whole new discoveries from the neuroscience the dreams of your customers would not be instantly available, but it's continuously talking, you know, with every, with, you know, on every occasion, I, I was continuously asking for the dream. And I thought I need to get that. And sometimes, you know, most of the times there was actually no answer, but I realized when I get to that point and mostly after a couple discussions. And so the dream analysis, in our today's world is part of our methodology. And it takes a couple interviews or a couple discussions, basically a couple meetings. And by the way, you know, dream still not, or, and then there comes, it, it will come and say, you know, actually, actually, you know, I have thought about your question a couple of times. I think I have it. This blah, 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 blah. That would be my dream for my business. If you get to that, as I just said, it's hard enough to get to the dream of them. But if you do, and then basically accumulate all these dreams and then build the solution, I, I need to say you cannot fail unless you screw up, you know, your business with, with, uh, you know, other stupid decisions or so. But if you're very strict about, you know, your team, your finance, I mean, all the executional parts, and follow the dream of your, of your audience, knowing that it may not be possible right now and taking it to the edge 
um, you, you will eventually be successful. So the, the expected outcome of this is actually building something fantastic, a groundbreaking innovation within six weeks. This is something when, when I talk to any type of customer on the blue column side, but also with, with, uh, you know, with, with our teams in, in the World Innovations Forum, people hear it and say, yeah, 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 okay, this is, this is, this is whatever dream <laughs> again, um, but we know it's possible because now we understand how our mind crafts ideas, how it, it processes it inside. We don't need to wait for an, you know, the magical idea because it will not come. Sometimes it comes, but also before, because there was a process before. Now, when we understand what this process was, we can emulate this process and we come to a magical ideas and we can make it happen in six to nine weeks. Let's say, give, give it three months. We need to get all the needs and challenges and fears and dreams and so forth from our audience. Then we mix it in an involvement um, and a follow-up process where we learn all the details and inputs uh, together as a team. And then we let our audience know what we're going to build with the hundreds and hundreds of inputs. And I remember I did this once with actually, this was with Computer 2000 with a competitor, even though I have to say, so it, it was a tough, I mean, it was a potential competitor. I was still at Rockwell and he was actually my distributor. And I told him, I said, Rudy, you know, I have this idea and I have to share it with you. I mean, it, it, it might be competition, it possibly will be, but um, you know, I value your input. And if I don't get feedback from a competitor, from a potential competitor, um, then it, it would not work. And so I told him the whole story. And this goes again, fear of somebody's copying me. He would be the best possible competitor copying this idea. He was, he was older, but he was not old enough to not change his mind. He had a mid-sized distributor company with about 50 employees and probably 200 million in revenue or something like that. And um, so he could, if he gets it, he could actually do exactly what I told him what it would be. Later, I realized he, why he did not after also talking to him, he did not know all the permutation in my mind that I had, you know, if this happens or that happens. He, in any way, he did not copy me and uh, we, we did not come into a comp competition because he actually shifted away from the space where we were written in. But it was an interesting, it was an interesting interview because I learned sort of some of my ultimate fears that the idea is still not 100% solid. But he can, he actually convinced me is that if you can pull this off what you just said, then I will bow for you. I mean, that would be amazing, but I don't believe you can do it. So, uh, okay, so it was clear for him that the idea was good, but he just couldn't see it's coming because nobody else did it. And so again, to build a groundbreaking innovation within a few weeks is actually what most of us innovative entrepreneurs did, that we got to this idea in a few weeks. And then there's another, you know, six to nine months of execution and building up the company and so forth, building up a prototype, building up an MVP, and then going to the market. And I had, um, a startup in my, uh, what was it? Accelerator. I think it was six or seven. And it was the, from the food industry. And as you know, food industry and getting food into the market, particular manufactured food is a hell of a ride because you have to get through all the approvals and, and what have you. And um, so I learned in Silicon Valley, you know, you have six months to get your product into the market or you will most likely fail. And when, I heard this the first time because we built an enterprise grade kind of application. 
I said to my investors, you know, I mean, this is an enterprise application. This is impossible. And he, he laughs and said, actually, yeah, yeah. stop telling me. I heard this more often than, than you probably imagine. I know it's possible. I come from, he was with, with Commerce One. We told our investors and they told us, and I tell you because of that, it's possible and I will help you to make it happen. I thought, okay, if you help me make it happen, then, then, then I'm all for it. And the same situation that happened with Yamo, that was the baby food company. And I thought when he told me about the rules and the regulation, particular baby food, I thought, oh, I don't know whether it's actually possible, but I didn't tell him until afterwards. And he was in the market six months later. And so I tell you that because you need to understand there is a time frame of innovation to market of six months and everybody who is has been you know through that through that tiny little uh funnel funnel um and made it made it because of using everything humanly possible to make it happen within six months because every every time longer it would take probably six years and i've seen a french startup it worked in six years on an algorithm. I don't even remember what they're doing. I mean, the company still uh, doesn't exist or, or, or never took off. But that is part, and you can only reach these six-month cycle or a quick, a quick um, point to get to groundbreaking innovation, the concept of the innovation, if you take your customers into, into your consideration. Okay, um, I skipped this um, and want to thank you very much for listening. Um, I took a little bit too much time, sorry. Um, but for the next session, we go uh, innovation financing. That will be an interesting part. And I can tell you this, if today's webinar sank in and you basically realize that this is the way to go, the next step of financing innovation will be possible. Without it, probably not. And we'll talk about this uh, why uh, uh, on November, is it November, early November. <clears throat> What's up on the horizon? We're launching our ICN network with about 900 investors uh, in the next few weeks. Um, we basically got a list and not a list. Um, yeah, we got a list of about 900 investors by selecting investors, investor networks from around the world. And um, we will start with, we have, we have uh, one or two con um, startups from Singapore, I think one from Germany, one from Switzerland. And we will introduce basically a one pager of what they're doing to this investor network. And as we get requests for investment, we will share this with this network. Um, the combined investment power is about a billion per year. So it is big. And uh, it took much longer than we thought, but we finally got to this point. And uh, so this is something on the horizon. And this is something for you to know <clears throat> that we will have substantial investment power through the World Innovations Forum, but investment power doesn't mean, okay, yeah, they, they will just randomly invest. They're investing in innovative businesses and innovative businesses only. They invest in investment ready companies and investment ready only. They invest in companies that are registered in one of the top financial countries, which is like Switzerland, Germany, the UK, Singapore, um, probably the US, maybe two or three others. And so what we did as part of the ICN, um, we will help startups to register in Singapore. And we focused on Singapore right now, publicly stated many times, it's the easiest company to register and the safest uh, country. Um, then if you need substantial funding, then that would be a powerful vehicle for you. And we will help you basically get there. Would be great if we become a member. We have an initiative go, coming up, Entrepreneurial 007. 
0.007% of humans on earth are entrepreneurs with a successful company. So it's a microscopic tiny number, but there is some ingredients of these people that make it happen. And we want to know if you are one of those. And our Innovation Management Academy 2021, we will start to help companies become these super successful companies. Um, and we're, as you know, we're expanding. So we're taking also more and more uh, activities in the developed world. So not only in the emerging countries any longer, but um, clearly, I mean, and you know this from everything we did and we said, the emerging countries are dear to our heart and we want to help as good as we can to make them successful. One thing I want to really make sure, successful means innovative businesses with innovative products that go global. If you want to do a tiny little startup because you think, oh, a tiny little startup is cool, then there are many companies and many organizations and many accelerators who help you. It would be not our focus. But if you want to grow a company that will help the GDP of your country to grow, then we're totally yours. Thank you very much. With that, I'm giving it back to Alyssa. Yes, thank you, Axel, for that great presentation. Um, and we had some great questions that came in. So without further ado, I will get started with those questions and you can answer them. Uh, so going back to when you discussed an idea getting stolen. So it was one or two um, of the first ones and companies are freaked out about this for sure. Uh, but we all know it and it's about the execution. Uh, what do you tell to the team slash company when they don't want to collaborate with the outside world because of this fear? So how do you tell your team members the same thing? Of, you know, you may agree that the idea shouldn't be stolen or couldn't be stolen, but how do you convince your team otherwise? Okay, interesting question. I mean, I think, you know, what, what I said about ideas, the value of an idea, there's a blog post um, on the World Innovations Forum website. Um, it's one of the most read um, is the, the initial value of an idea is zero. And if you share this with your team, that will be probably helpful so that they understand that the idea itself is not that big of a deal. The idea that is composed from many, many people becomes a big idea. And then to take this and execute on that becomes actually the reality of the idea. Uh, but the idea itself, one idea, we have 30,000 ideas through our life, or depending on what statistic you're looking for, it's sometimes people call talking about more than a half a million. Uh, times 7 billion people. I mean, we have trillions of ideas, um, no value. Yeah. Great, but yep, the name of the blog post is the initial value idea zero, and I'm just about to put it in the chat so you guys all have access to that. Oh, awesome. <laughs> so next question, open innovation can involve cross-cultural exchange. Do you have any advice on working with different cultures within innovation? Um, that's an excellent question. If you look at, you know, I mean, we, we have cultures, we have religions, we have skin colors, all these sort of things that, that we perceive as a big difference. But if you look at idea creation and you look at our brain, three pounds, 86 billion neurons connected to each other, 200 million neurons right and left brain half. This has nothing to do with culture, has nothing to do with um, religion or skin color or size or I mean, any of this, female, male. This is part of completely agnostic to the outside world that we perceive as important. So there is no reason to have not any kind of different culture. Actually, it's the other way around. The culture contribute to the variety of experiences. So take them all in. I mean, that's sort of my, my, my short answer. Great. Next question we have is, how much does it cost or should cost to learn about your customers? For instance, for testing an e-car or a battery? 
so, sorry, I, I did. What? How much does it cost to to what? Uh, how much does it cost or should cost to learn about your customers? Oh, that is, it costs nothing but time. I mean, you know, you, you, you try to find out who your customers are. And if, if you don't know, then I would say your innovative idea is a little bit in jeopardy because you then don't know what their problems are. And then the question is, why do you even start a company solving something where a problem doesn't exist? Yeah. Yeah, that was a quick and good answer. Um, next question we have is, what if I just don't have an innovative idea and build a solution that is still great, but not innovative? But not? But not innovative. Oh, okay. You know, the question is, what is a great idea that is not innovative? I mean, you know, if you look into the world today, we have we have a lot of people who are doing a lot of things and you know, somebody is opening a new pizza store around the corner in a segment of a city where there has not been a pizza store. And so they will be successful. Why not? And if they do a good job and serve their customers well, and maybe have the super pizza with, uh, I don't know, with a bit of a chocolate on top, which is probably not seen very often in pizza. Cool. You know, um, if you were if you're having a couple ideas about improving car repairs and you know do a car repair shop uh, anywhere that's all good so there is there is no necessity to be innovative um if you you open up a new doctor's office and uh, you know doctors are in high demand um not innovative totally cool so and in, in this regard is a good question. So non-innovative businesses will survive, will stay in, in the context of, you know, our society, depending on demand and so on, nothing wrong with it. Totally cool, go for it. We, the World Innovations Forum, is an organization that focuses on innovation and helping non-innovative companies to become innovative in order to, I mean, massively compete in a, in a space that is difficult and or not difficult, but basically bring humanity to the next level. That's our focus. And so if you are starting a non-innovative company, yeah, absolute cool. I mean, we probably need thousands and thousands of good and well-run non-innovative companies. It's just not part of our activity as World Innovations Forum. Yeah. Yep. That was a good answer. Um, so a question that's come in is, I have pitched an idea to a panel who rubbished my idea and later found out a very similar thing was being done with support from some of the panelists. So essentially, they, the panelists um, said, oh, no, it's a terrible idea, but then later on found that they had taken that idea. What advice would you give me to prevent the, things, thing, the, the likes of this happening again? Sorry. <laughs> so. I mean, it goes back to ideas, to stealing ideas. I mean, if, if you take an idea to somebody else and they say it's terrible and you, you say, oh, okay, they said it's terrible, so therefore I don't continue. And they make it and uh, make it big, you know, then I have to say, you know, sorry, you were not believing in your own idea. And then, and if they understood and executed very well, they rightfully bring, brought the idea to the top. Because again, the initial value of an idea is zero. The value is in the execution. And if they were executing and you were not, well, yeah, fair that they, they did it because they helped then a certain audience to get to something cool. And if you don't, then you don't deserve any kind of, you know, whatever. So it's the execution of the idea that make, creates the value. Um, and you can prevent this by executing, but still talking to others. And if they say it's bad, you know, okay, it's bad. You talk to more and more and more people. And if everybody says, I mean, our suggestion is typically ask at least 43 people and diverse structure, 
And if five say it's bad and then they st run and try to do the same on their own, fine. There's another saying, you cannot become a market leader if you don't have followers. And if your idea, you lead a market with your new idea and somebody else follows, sooner or later people will say, oh, this is like, you know, your idea. Okay, this is like you. Hmm, interesting. So everybody who is actually stealing your idea and copying your idea is almost always basically promoting you as the one who had the idea the first time. But if you are not talking to the market and keep this close to you for no fear somebody would steal it, um, then they will win, of course. But if you're, if you're exposing your idea, I mean, boldly and massively, um, I mean, like when we started with, with Blue Column, we had an idea. We didn't even have a product. We started webinars, all kinds of things. Of the product actually became after we realized, wow, there is interest. There's a real market. We even got deals. We got customers. And so now we're building finally the product and we're sharing whatever we do with everybody who wants to know and even those who don't want to know. No, I mean, going into the market is, is critical for your success and people need to follow you. Otherwise you don't become a leader. So it, it will be okay, uh, you know, but just stick to your ideas and then execute well. That's a great answer, I think. Um, we have another question. How do you deal with founders who think they own the idea? Who think they own the idea? They own the idea, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, some founders think they own the idea. And if they have a patent, then they truly own the idea. If they don't have a patent, then they don't own the idea. Um, I mean, the, the, and this goes back to the, to the culture question. I mean, there are cultures and, and we've seen this in our accelerator program where we had, particularly in San Francisco, we had people coming from around the world. Um, depending on the culture, when they told me about their idea, they used the word trust a million times. The thing they want to change and want to implement and want to embrace is trust. Because in some cultures, nobody trusts anybody. That's part of the culture. And um, there's nothing you can do. Uh, the only thing you can do is actually break that barrier by becoming trustful by never use the word trust again and actually be trustful rather than telling people to be trustful and share everything publicly. And if somebody steals whatever you said and whatever you, you shared, you know, f fine. I mean, you know, there, there, there is no, how to say that, there is no ownership on intellectual creation because of what we just learned, you know, everything that we create in our mind comes from past experiences means meaning from others anyway so with every idea we try to possess it's actually we quote unquote could say we stole it from hundreds of people even though we didn't because the idea remains to be no value and uh, so let people say it's their idea i mean it, it really doesn't matter what matters is if you have a patent, then this patent has to be honored. I mean, that's, that's a law that we have and many people actually try to fight that law because it's inaccurate. Because even a patent on an idea is actually not really okay because that idea cannot come from somebody sort of in isolation. Uh, but in any, in any case, so we have a law and then we have to honor the law no matter what, whether we find it right or wrong. We can start arguing with the government and the lawmakers and the policymakers that this is not okay, this is one thing. But at the current stage, somebody says, this is my idea and I do with it what I want. Okay, fine, yeah, let them do what they want. If it's your idea, then you do what you want. If it's both of your idea, then both of you do what you want. I mean, there's nothing that can stop anybody from, from using it unless there's a patent. Yeah. Okay, um, another question. Can you share what is the most effective methodology for customer discovery that you have done or seen before? I, I didn't understand. If you can take your microphone maybe a little bit closer. 
I said the most effective methodology for customer discovery that you have done or seen before. Okay, uh, that's a good one. The, I, and I learned a lot by doing a lot of them. So um, I started with being prepared with a lot of questions. And I finished with only having one question. And also finished with having never used a or never to use a, a questionnaire. I mean, like sending it out per email or something like that. Because in every answer you get, and this is also part of the methodology, you get two forms of an answer. You get the, the, the factual spoken answer and you get an emotional answer. And the emotional answer is like, the factual answer would be, yes, this is a good product. The emotional answer could be two things. Yes, this is a good product or yes, this is a very good product or just not very, this is a good product. You know, that emotional component of the spoken word is half the battle, so to speak. If people get excited or yeah, it's still positive, but not excited. Um, and so I only have one question that I ask, what would be your ideal scenario? What would be the best product in this, you know, that help you with your job? And from that question, you get an answer. And if, it, if you tell people it's only one question, then you still can have follow on questions, but it should be related obviously to this one question, what would be the best possible solution for you? Period. Not a list, not anything else. And then there is within this question, you, you can ask <clears throat> a follow on question that is very critical because when they say something, you know, you want to verify. And so you can verify with another question saying, okay, so what exactly is the problem you are having to solve? And you know, that, that would be not the coming up with great idea would be doing this and that, but what's the problem we have? And if you have answers to that, there come a couple of different questions when you verify your idea, but in the initial question, it's the one question, what would be the ideal solution for you to, you know, work on or work with or help solve your problems and so forth. That's it. <laughs> Great. Uh, so we have a couple more questions before our time runs out. Uh, so I'll go ahead and ask them. How can I best approach people as if I don't have any customers yet? Okay, good one. Um, that, that is, that is a, an initial tough thing because you wonder how can you speak to people you don't know uh, without being friends that actually not becoming customers. And depending, again, it's a little bit country, uh, country by country variance, but in most of the world, business users are using and in some other cases, they're using Facebook. Uh, there might be different areas like in China, they're probably using other, uh, there's there some LinkedIn users, but they're maybe using Run Run or QQ or one of these, these social networks. But the best possible audience you find actually in the respective social web. Because people who are using social media are typically people who naturally expose themselves. If you are talking to people who are closed and don't want to talk too much, don't want to be exposed, really want to be hidden, they're the worst to talk to because you would, it's like pulling teeth. You don't get the answers that you want, but those exposures are open and these open exposures are the ones you want to interview. Um, the other reason about social media or these social networks is that they're digitally easy to reach and you see their profile and you see, well, that would be a cool customer and that would be probably not a good cool customers. And you automatically per definition 
you would get to people and not to brands. I mean, you can say, hey, yeah, I want Exxon Oil or I want IBM or I want Toyota or I want, you know, you name it. But that doesn't mean anything um, because the only way, the only one you can interview is human beings. And so like in LinkedIn or in any of the social web, uh, Facebook and so forth, you find them basically based on, your, on, their, on their profile. And if they have their company profile, then you know, okay, this is with that company. Um, and therefore, again, LinkedIn is probably the best search tool for that or equivalent uh, networks. And then you approach them and the approach is also not easy because you don't want to be spammy. You don't want to be promotional. You don't want to be any like that. And so, I mean, when we started just recently, we did the same, had the same issue because th there was no customer for that. Uh, the, the innovation platform. And, and so we said, hey, um, you know, I saw, I saw you from your profile, uh, you're in the innovation space or something like that. And I'd like to pick your brain. We are developing an innovation solution in our case. Um, uh, would you have time for, for a quick chat? And then typically they, they look up you and then your profile need to be perfect. I mean, everything you've done in your life need to be exposed. You need to be as open as a, you know, public sheet of paper and they need to understand what is it, what you're working on. If you hide it again, forget it. So if you're open and have a web page and explaining what you're trying to do and you're not fearing that your competitor is stealing your idea, then they would find you. Your competitors would find you anyway, but you know, your potential customer wouldn't find you. And so you expose on this website what you're trying to do, even though you don't have a product and you just have sort of a rough concept. So put it up there. And my and our experience is that we get about 20 to 30, 40 uh, contacts, I, I mean, contact confirmations uh, a week, depending on how much we send out. So if we send out 100, which is sort of probably a good number per week, then we get half of them coming back. Yeah, happy to help, happy to do this, happy to do that. Um, in our case, I can tell you our US VP and somebody we worked with for a long time, I think we have now 300 innovation managers who actually connected with them. We can interview and we can talk to. And so this happened to be probably the best methodology and you would actually looking for whatever you produce uh, who could be your, who could be your customer. And then you tell them, you know, you're, you're a startup, you're just starting, you need their help and people have a tendency to help others. So, so there's no reason unless you get salesy, oh, this is the best thing in the world and blah, blah, blah. And it will be cheap and don't sell at all. I mean, every even hint of a sales attempt would kill this. Um, and so this is how you get to the people and then you get to the interview. Okay, um, so I'll ask one last question uh, just to end it on a high note. Uh, you, as you said, are launching the ICM with 900 investors uh, in the fall or later in the fall and in the winter time. So what are the requirements to get funded by the ICM? Okay, um, I think we will have this in the next couple of days on the World Innovations Forum website. Um, there is probably on the ICN webpage already a statement for the investors, what we are actually, what we're actually looking for on the investment side. And there you can see it. So it need to be a founder's team. So solo entrepreneurs, we wouldn't take because investors are just not interested in solo entrepreneurs. Um, a founder's team where the founders have at least 20% uh, stake in the company, have invested money in the company, uh, you have a prototype. Uh, let me think what, what else. There, there, there's a couple of these things uh, you may want to check out. Uh, we formed a org slash ICN, I believe, or program ICN. Um, and you will, you will find uh, some of that, but we will have um, a, a, a form where, uh, where startups and companies who want to participate or benefit from the IT network, fill out basically a form. And then there's a couple of things we want you to help the investors understand uh, one pager, 
uh, financial data, a deck and so forth uh, to, to share this with them. And very clearly, I mean, that is, a, that is an open innovation, an open uh, sort of for, innovate, for, for investors that you, you expose everything basically publicly. So if you are very cautious with not exposing too much, I can only tell you, you know, this, this is fully understandable. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, but you diminish the opportunity to get investments the closer you get. The more open you are, the easier it is for an investor. And um, just think about it. I mean, on the stock exchange, public companies, billion dollar global enterprises have to put down their pens, so to speak, and share everything they have, you know, the revenue, where we're from, how much profit they make, everything. So, you know, the world is an open space, ideally. And so obviously it's up to you how, how, you, how, you, how far you go, but um, that's something to consider. Yeah. Yeah, just to clarify, we had this question come in and I wanted to verify, ICN stands for? Oh yeah, Innovation Capital Network. So, so it's, it's basically a network of investors who put capital in innovative companies. And like I said earlier, and the question relates to that uh, earlier, um, it's simply the way we defined ourselves as an innovation forum. So it's all about innovation. We're not looking or not, I mean, we don't have the resources even for, for everything and everybody. So innovative businesses is our, is our focus. Perfect, good. I'm glad we clarified that with all of our attendees. So the time is out and it looks like all of our questions have been addressed. So I just want to say thank you, Axel, for another great presentation and a great webinar on customer insights. Um, I hope all of our attendees gained something valuable out of it and will join our next one, Innovation Financing. Uh, so again, thank you for everybody who did participate. If you haven't already, please follow us or join our Facebook group, our LinkedIn, Twitter. Uh, we are happy to continue the questions and presentation on there. Um, and have some great debates if we need to. Uh, we will be hosting the next Knowledge Transfer web series on the first Monday of every month. So the next one is Innovation Financing, as you said. It will be on November 2nd. I, I will follow up with you in the next couple of days with the webinar recording as well as the presentation from today. But in the meantime, if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to any of our team members and we will be happy to address them. Uh, so without further ado, thank you all and thank you, Axel, for everything. And have a great day for everybody else. All right. Thank you also. Thank you much, Alyssa. Great organization. Great questions. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.